Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's EACC webinar, Trade Disputes, Steel, Sweaters, and Wine, Repairing the U.S.-EU Relationship Under the Biden Administration. This event is organized by the European American Chamber of Commerce and our network of chapters across the United States and Europe. The EACC is where Europeans and Americans connect to do business. My name is Kristina Slezinska. I'm the executive director of the Florida chapter of the EACC and lead organizer for this program. So for today's program on trade disputes, steel, sweaters, and wine, repairing the US-EU relationship under the Biden administration, we have many registrants from both sides of the Atlantic. Some of you asked questions when you registered and we pass them on to our panel. Thank you for doing that. One disclaimer, Please note that all comments and opinions presented by our speakers are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the EACC or of its members. So, we are back. America is back. And now that we have a new administration in the White House, everything will change when it comes to trade relations between the US and the EU. Or will it? So let's find out with our terrific cast of panelists. First on the list is Thomas Barth. Thomas joined the European Commission in Brussels in 2005. He held various positions there at DG Trade and also in Geneva at the EU representation to the WTO. He has been at the EU delegation in Washington DC since 2018 as head of the trade and agricultural section in charge of the planning, management and coordination of EU trade policy in the US. And as we all should know, it is the EU which negotiates trade agreements with third countries with its trading partners on behalf of its member states. And then on to Ryan Evans. Ryan joined the British Consulate General in Atlanta in 2019. She serves as Senior Trade Policy Advisor and promotes the British government's international trade policy objectives. It's no longer news. The UK has left the EU. But Ryan, we're delighted to have you here with us today. Next, we have Laura Ziegel Rabinovitz. Laura is a partner at Greenberg Traurig at the Greenberg Traurig Global Law Firm, and, and she counsels domestic and multinational businesses on complex supply chain issues and other challenges associated with international trade, mitigation of duty, exposure, compliance, and so on. Laura, we're delighted to have you with us, and Laura will be our moderator for the day. Last but not yeah. least, Hubert Surville. Hubert started his career in France in the dairy and beverage sector. He moved to the United States several decades ago, where he has been in the wine and spirits business in Florida since the early 1990s. Wines have been particularly hit by US tariffs, so we look forward to hearing more about it. So, America's back, and now, without further ado, Laura, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Christina, and welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, we're going to be focusing on issues confronting companies who are manufacturing globally, importing and exporting globally, and how U.S. trade policy is going to change under President Biden. Many of the issues, of course, that the Trump administration addressed will continue to impact U.S. importers, and they will be tackled by this new administration. China, steel and aluminum, forced labor, and an effort to increase domestic manufacturing in the United States. What we do know is that um, there will be a focus by the Biden administration on U.S. manufacturing, including enhancing Buy America policies. Biden has already issued his first uh, executive order on federal procurement, stating his preference for domestic, um, domestic products. And we fully expect to see additional executive orders on Buy America policies. Uh, Biden's nominated U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai has already made statements that she will focus on U.S. manufacturing. So we'll see um, how this impacts the U.S.-EU relationship. Uh, Catherine Tai's not, um, hearing is will start before the Senate Finance Committee on Thursday, and we expect her um, confirmation vote before the full Senate uh, within the next two weeks. So for U.S. companies, 
who are waiting the fate on the myriad of additional tariffs imposed by the Trump administration, they are still in place. Um, the Section 301 tariffs on products of China, products of the EU, the, as known as the Airbus tariffs, steel and aluminum, and additional tariffs on products such as solar, uh, solar products. Um, what we have heard so far is that the Biden team is reviewing these issues, including the national security aspects, and Biden has repeatedly said that he wants to work with his European allies and other developed countries to cooperate on these issues. In fact, after the G7 meeting on Friday, the group pledged to work together in combating China. Now, the European, our European allies have hinted that they will not be in lockstep with the United States. China recently surpassed the United States and is now the largest trading partner with the EU. And to be clear, that's in goods, not goods and services, in which case the US is still number one. The EU and China have also recently signed a comprehensive agreement on investment that was signed during the transition. Biden asked the EU to delay the signing, but um, was not agreed to by the EU. Now it won't go into effect for at least a couple of years, but it has been signed. So our first question, how will the US, uh, how do we expect the US to engage with the EU and the UK? And how would you like the EU and the UK to engage with the US? Um, Ryan first and then Tomas, please. Yeah, thank you for that question, Laura, and, and thanks for having me um, on this panel today. I, I think to your first question, how do we expect the Biden administration to engage with the e with the EU and the UK can only, of course, speak for the UK on this. But I think we have been encouraged by um, at least the the tones that have been set of kind of coming back into uh, the global conversation, coming back into the organizations of which we're we're all a part. Um, and so the UK certainly wants to take advantage of, of every opportunity um, to have constructive engagement with the Biden administration, whether that's through bilateral conversations, through our G7 pres presidency this year, um, or at multilateral organizations like the UN, the OECD, and the WTO. Um, so, so we're um, taking some of these signals as, as a positive and, and looking forward to um, once, once the cabinet is fully set up, moving forward with constructive conversations. Thank you, Laura. It's great to join you from, uh, from Washington, D.C. I thank you for the opportunity to also share some uh, EU perspective on this question. I think from our side, we really want to go from a negative conversation to a more positive conversation. Last four years, we were often, as the European Union, seen more as a problem than as a partner to the United States. And we need to go back to the partnership. And I think that's what we're already seeing uh, a little bit. But what that means in substantive terms is that we want to move away from tariffs and threats and tweets in a way, and we need to get back to more productive uh, discussions on some of the global challenges and the global issues that we have, and we've outlined many of them already. We have COVID to deal with, we have climate to deal with, we have, we have China to deal with, um, and, and those are critical uh, issues also from a trade um, perspective. So we really want to, let's say, rekindle the romance in our relationship uh, a little bit more, uh, get back to a more positive uh, agenda, a more positive focus. One of the things we've always learned and heard from businesses is that businesses can deal well with complexity, but they can't deal very well with uncertainty. So we want to get back to more certainty in the relationship. And I'm pretty sure that some of the issues will still be complex and we'll have to manage that complexity. But if we can do that with a more positive mindset and with, with a more positive approach, appreciating the, the alliance basically, and then the partnership that we have, I'm pretty confident that we will get back to a, a productive and a very positive agenda. Great, yeah, thank you, thank you both. So, of course, there are several substantive issues. I mean, you've, you've addressed the change in tone, hopefully. Um, but in terms of the substantive issues that the US and the EU need to address, um, we have the long running Airbus Boeing dispute. Um, it's been before the WTO since 2004. Once the WTO made its findings, the US imposed additional tariffs on products of the EU. The EU imposed tariffs on US made goods. And that, of course, is on top of the general rate of duty. 25% on consumer products, 15% on aircraft parts. It's cheese, fruit, meat, olives, Irish and Scotch whiskeys. Um, 
and, and I know from our discussions, Tomas, that there's a, a great appetite by the EU to work with the United States on this issue. Um, and meanwhile, consumer products on both sides, you know, continue to have the tariffs, um, and we haven't yet solved the underlying issues. So let's first, uh, I'm going to first turn to Uber to speak to the impact of this long running, I mean, really long running Airbus Boeing dispute um, on your industry. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for having me. Uh, well, yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, the wine and spirit industry is uh, taken hostage in this uh, trade war, which is not supposed to be involving the wine and spirit industry, like many other categories of products, but here we are. And it's uh, maybe before you know I answer the question of what is the impact, I, I have to explain that the first customer of French wines in the world is the US. So any action, obviously, of such a retaliation tariff has deep impact on the business. In addition, in the past 10 years, before uh, November 18, 2019, uh, date of inception of this tariff, uh, France has enjoyed 10, 10 years, consecutive years of growth of exports to the US. Well, in 2020, uh, the shipments to the US directly related to this were down by 13.5% in volume and 18% in value, which clearly shows that this increase of cost, increase of selling price has directly affected the level of consumption of that segment. Uh, it is, I guess, I guess, also noteworthy that uh, these tariffs have been cleverly uh, imposed in a way that not every country, but the wine and spirits, for instance, is stacked the same way. Uh, it, for instance, the Italian wines do not suffer this 25% tax. So it's an interesting, uh, you know, curveball also into this uh, European uh, association. Uh, it, it was interesting also to see that they, at the inception, there was a difference between Irish whiskies and UK whiskies. So uh, <laughs> same same story, you see, uh, there is an expression, stirring the pot, right? I think, I think somewhere, somehow, that was the goal. It is interesting also, maybe on a positive note, as Thomas highlighted, to see that the purpose of these tariffs is not to disrupt the business, but to just get everybody around the table to make, a, hopefully, an amicable and long-term agreement. Good, Uber, thank you. I I actually would like to pick up on what you mentioned about that stirring the pot and how each country was not treated, you know, the same way on every list. I mean, the list on with the tariffs is very product specific and country specific. Um, you know, for example, olives are um, France, Spain, and Germany, and not Italy. Um, sweaters are, uh, you know, sweaters and other apparel is only the UK. So maybe Tomas and Ryan can, can speak to that, the, the impact of it, as Hubert said, the stirring of the pot. Well, first of all, um, if, I, if I can start on this one, maybe uh, I, you said it already, Laura, this is a long-standing dispute and I think Hubert is right. We need to come to the table and I think we, we are ready to be negotiating on the table because really all the elements after 15 years of litigation, all the elements are there and the priority should clearly be to settle this dispute, which we're very willing to do. And we have made a proposal to suspend tariffs for a period of six months. And that's the time we think we need and, and perhaps even less to, to work out a solution. Um, and that is really what we need to do. All the elements are there. Um, the, the legal procedures have, uh, have been, uh, been completed. Uh, the tariffs are in place on both sides. Both sides have taken steps to comply with the, um, uh, the findings of the dispute settlement uh, proceedings. Uh, we have an airline industry that is not doing well and an aircraft industry that is not doing well, of course. So we need to think about that. And in the meantime, China is subsidizing its building aircraft. So I think all the elements are there. What we really need is a focused effort now to, to come to the table and to, to solve it. We are certainly ready. We were ready to do the deal already with the Trump administration. For some reason, the Trump administration was not ready to do it then. Uh, which is why we thought we now propose to take six months and to solve this dispute as well as others which i'm sure we'll talk about and uh, and work out a solution now on your point maybe specifically of um, the us targeting certain member states and certain sectors and first of all i should say i understand how the wine and spirits industry more generally as well as other industries feel that this is very unfair because this is not they're not selling aircraft they are they're selling wines which is a wonderful product of course um but, but this is somehow the rules of the game that that 
some people, some sectors, some countries uh, get affected. Um, and that's also how, how our measures are designed. Some sectors are, are affected more than others, and that means some states might be more uh, affected than others. Um, tariffs are never the solution. Tariffs are never um, an end in itself. They're a means to an end. And in this case, in the case of a dispute, it's really to, to come to a solution, to come to a to put the, the dispute to bed, and that's what we're committed to doing, and we're, we're hopeful that we can do that uh, very, very soon with the Biden administration. Yeah. Thomas, do you think, you mentioned the six-month period. Do you think that that's a realistic time frame for the parties to sit down and, and try to talk about, you know, I mean, at this point, we need a, a you know, it's not a global solution, but it's a, a cross-Atlantic solution. Well, where, there, where there's a will, there's a way, Laura, and I think it, it doesn't take six months, to be honest. It, it, it can be done very quickly, um, provided that we have the momentum and the interest to, to come to a solution. And as mentioned, I believe all the elements are there. And if now the, the broader climate uh, of our relationship is one where we're trying to put to bed these disputes and we focus on, as I mentioned, our positive agenda as opposed to the negative issues, um, I think we should be able to do that. And I don't even think we need six months for that. Great. Thank you. Ryan, do you want to talk about how re-engagement will happen between the parties, the UK and the US? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, the UK is one of the four family countries of, of Airbus. So um, it's certainly uh, an issue that is affecting not only our um, our interests, but but the interests of, of countries in the EU and, and frankly, businesses in, in the US who, um, you know, Airbus is located in different parts of, of the United States. It has supply chains that um, are, are embedded in, in the region that where I sit um, in the southeast of the United States. So, so it's it's important to, to try to get a resolution to this. That's why the UK has has made concerted efforts to bring itself into compliance with, with the orders. We've suspended our own tariffs on US goods under this um, dispute. And so it, it for us, it's about getting getting a solution and getting to the table and, and coming to a settlement. Um, and, and I'd have to say we're we're in the same, um, you know, and much in the same vein and boat as, as Tomas is saying, we think we can do it quickly. It's a matter of, of getting um, our US stakeholders uh, and interlocutors at the table. Um, and some of that's dictated by by Congress. And, um, you know, we're, we're just kind of at, at the mercy of, of, you know, of their timing at this point, but, but we think we can do it quickly as well. So um, it's, it's just a matter of time now, I think, especially since COVID has has aggravated um, so much of these industries as well, that that I think things will move forward. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I like the optimistic tone from both of you, certainly. Um, so uh, in terms of the digital services task, tax, um, at this point, numerous countries have either implemented a, ta a DST or have it, uh, proposed DST. Um, and it is, as it sounds, um, a tax on video streaming, digital marketplaces, et cetera, um, aimed at technology companies with international consumers. Um, under the Trump uh, US Trade Representative, they were poised to impose an additional 25% on specific French goods because of the French implementation of their DST. And at really the 11th hour decided not to do that um, and, and decided to allow the Biden administration to deal with this um, growing issue. Um, and then Biden, uh, again on Friday, after the G7 meeting, made comments saying that he wanted to work with allies on a global solution to the issue of digital taxation. Um, it certainly is becoming a global issue. Um, so, Tomas, now, without getting into the weeds of global taxation, um, what does the EU want to see in terms of a global solution? And then, Ryan, if you could comment. Thank you. Well, this is a, a very important uh, question, Laura, and, and the issue is one of, of fair taxation in the digital economy. We basically want to make sure that all companies, whether they're online or offline, pay their fair share in, in taxes. And that's an issue that we have addressed, raised in, in the OECD context, uh, but many countries around the world have are facing the same issues, and many states in the United States are facing this issue, as Maryland has last week also um, uh, moved forward with uh, a digital services tax of some sort. So we all agree on the problem. The question is, can we agree on the solution? And for the European Union, we are built around the idea that we don't want to have 27 individual responses to the same problem. That's why we have an internal market. That's why we are a union, the European Union that 
acts with a single voice in critical areas uh, such as trade. So we really want to come together in the global family, in the, in the world uh, context, in, in, in the OECD in particular, and to work out a solution that really fundamentally deals with fair tax in the digital economy. This is not about targeting anyone in particular. Uh, this is not about targeting US companies, or it's not about targeting Silicon Valley in any way. This is about making sure that everyone pays share in taxes. And we're all struggling with the same question. So let's struggle together and let's work out a, a solution uh, multilaterally. And I'm very pleased to see that President Biden, indeed, after the G7, recommitted to that. I think Secretary Yellen already in her first comments has recommitted to the OECD process. And there again, we have another six months, more or less, to kind of work out a solution. Um, and if we don't, then it's clear that, that we need to accept that some countries are moving ahead. And that is what we're doing. We're trying to innovate in this area and deal with the challenges that we see and the fairness that we see in our, in our system. Um, so the, the, the global solution is the first best, but the second best is that we will move ahead as, as we do on our own. We'll come, we'll come up with our own ideas in that case. Yep. And uh, on this point, you know, the UK has already um, set out its its proposal for a DST and, and it was a process, right? I, the UK consulted with industries and developed a, a regime that it feels is that we feel is, you know, proportional interim solution. It's not, um, you know, our preference is to go through the OECD process and, and come to a global solution, but certainly with the amount of um, tech industry in, in the UK, it was important for us to come to, to some kind of um, process that we can we can use um, in our new role um, and and we have also been encouraged by uh, by Secretary Yellen's um, comments on the OECD process and looking forward to to taking this forward on the G7 finance track um, and especially when when the leaders summit occurs in June um, we're we're looking forward to seeing what might come out of this so again with uh, we're looking at the same kind of time frame six months to to try to come to come to grips with what what this looks like moving forward um, and and how do we deal with with business uncertainty with with the different uh, regimes that could be coming out from from Maryland um, and you you see what's happening in Florida while not a digital services tax is certainly something to to keep an eye out in the in the tech space and what it could look like moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, very much, very much a new world, and um, I, I'm all for uh, the United States participating uh, with the OECD and and getting you know, back and having a global solution to the issue because it's it really is a growing issue. Um, okay, China, China, China. Um, after Biden and, and President Xi spoke recently, President Biden said to reporters that the U.S. has to ratchet up our efforts to compete with China or they're going to eat our lunch. Um, substantively, then, the, United, the White House issued a statement saying that Biden raised his fundamental concerns about Beijing's coercive and unfair economic practices, as well as human rights issues and preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Um, at the same time, it is clear that the Section 301 tariffs on products of China will remain in place until after the administration's review. And at that point, the administration will decide which ones, if any, to roll back. Um, as, as most of you know, I'm sure the 301 tariffs were imposed by the Trump administration on 370 billion worth of goods manufactured in China and imported into the US. And those tariffs are at 25% additional duty or an additional 7.5% on a smaller list. Uh, clearly, Biden would lose any leverage if he just immediately rolled them back, and, and he's not going to do that. Um, so based on his comments, it, it seems clear that Biden is not going to be soft in confronting China. And also, that uh, it seems that his administration is going to have an, a holistic approach in developing their strategy. Um, Clearly, uh, we appreciate that, you know, for companies, you know, trying to plan in 2021, it, this wait and see is, is tremendous, um, un, is a tremendous uncertain times. Um, but the issues behind the so Section 301 tariffs, intellectual property, technology transfer issues, currency manipulation, those are all still there. And on top of that, 
Um, there's a, a huge new uh, Asian trade pact, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Pact, which was recently signed by 15 countries in the Indo-Pacific region, including China. It creates a tremendous regional bloc. It eliminates tariffs on 91% of the goods. Um, in response to RCEP, Biden just said that the U.S. should be setting trade policy rather than sitting on the sidelines. So clearly there's pressure on the United States to, to deepen our involvement in Asia Pacific while still being tough on China and engaging with our European allies to set policy with regard to China. Um, so first Ryan and then Tomas, how do you expect the US to, to work with the UK and the EU vis-a-vis -vis China? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. I, I think it's um, something that, that the UK we were dealing with a bit in the spotlight during the Trump administration. There was a lot of pr uh, pressure applied uh, based on Huawei and, and their um, participation in networks in the UK and the European Union. Um, and so, so it's something that uh, we, we've dealt with under the Trump administration and now are looking how, how we'll proceed with um, with the Biden administration. Certainly our interests are, are shared in many areas, especially when it comes to intellectual property and kind of the idea of setting the rules of the road. Um, but it might they might diverge in, in how we um, set and finally address those issues. Uh, but one of the things that the UK, that we've done uh, in the in recent months is is announce our intention to accede to the uh, comprehensive um, the CPTPP the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. So um, we're looking to do that as m a lot of our trading partners are in uh, Southeast Asia, and so we're that's one avenue where we're looking to to address. China um, and another avenue is through the potential free trade agreement between the US and UK um, to that point of trying to set the rules of the road and have high standard trade agreements. This is an avenue that we're looking to, to set some of those, whether that's in intellectual property rights, um, kind of digital, digital trade, uh, or how we um, deal with non-market economies. It's, it's an area that we're looking to, to negotiate and, and work with the Biden administration constructively. Well, on our side, we, we very much agreed, actually, with with the diagnosis from the Trump administration, but we didn't agree so much on the prescription. And I think the critical question here is, can we agree together with the Biden-Harris administration on how to deal with China? And what is our, what is our remedy uh, fundamentally? The diagnosis is clear. There is, at least from the trade and economic perspective, a too large public footprint on private markets in China. We're seeing that in the form of forced technology transfer, as mentioned, IP violations, uh, state-owned enterprises and, and trade distortions and uncompetitive behavior more generally. Now, if that is our problem, how do we deal with it? Tariffs, in our view, or wasn't really the solution. It never really is a solution, as we just discussed in the context of our disputes. Um, but what we really need to do is to work together and to come together on a, a common goal of, of dealing with this challenge of having new rules, stronger rules and better rules to fundamentally deal with uncompetitive behavior, and with trade distortions. And that's why the European Union, together with the United States and Japan, has engaged in what is called a trilateral process, where we define as a sort of a laboratory, we define the rules of the road that, that we want uh, China and others to uh, subscribe to. And obviously that is going to be a collaborative effort at some point with other allies. And uh, we, we need to have that conversation with China. But alliances are, are pretty, clearly uh, key. And so we expect by an administration to work with us and to work with a similar direction. Um, and, uh, and, and fundamentally deal with the challenges that I think we also agree on. Great, Th thank you, thank you both. Um, so going back to uh, Biden's focus on domestic manufacturing for a minute, um, the U.S. steel industry is very against uh, lifting tariffs on steel and aluminum. Um, so right now, we're, it, we don't know what will happen with the tariffs and quotas that the Trump administration Im imposed on steel and aluminum. Um, most likely, President Biden will do a country by country review. I know there's been a push by the Europeans to remove tariffs on EU steel and aluminum. Um, 
that the Europeans are, you know, offended that they were imposed under a national security provision, um, Section 232 of the Trade Act of 1962. Um, so other than, you know, immediately lifting the tariffs, uh, how would you like the steel and aluminum issue resolved, uh, Thomas and then Ryan? No, I mean, again, we, what we need to focus on here is what is the actual solution? What is the actual problem, rather? Um, and the actual problem is overcapacity in China. We have a huge problem of overcapacity in the steel markets, and that is not caused by high-end European uh, steel producers. That is caused by uh, lower-end producers coming mostly out of uh, China. And so we need to confront uh, that problem and recognize that the imports of steel into the United States from Europe are not a national security. That's where we need to start, and, and at the same time, as we recognize that, we need to find a way to deal with the real problem here, which is the Chinese overcapacity question. We're ready to do that. Um, we can work together in, in the OECD context, in the context of the Global Forum on Steel, for example. Uh, we can have more transparency, have more discussions, and have more disciplines to really deal with the problem there where it exists and where it arises. European Union and others uh, produce high-end steel products that are very much needed and are very much part of the supply chain here in the United States for many industries. And, and that is really the reality that we also need to recognize. So having tariffs, again, is not a solution in this case. Um, these are not uh, justifiable in any way by a national security exception, as you already uh, mentioned yourself. And we will just need to focus on, on the real problem here, which is, yet again, Chinese overcapacity. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have to agree. The UK, from from our perspective, has, has always been a trusted partner and ally of the United States. And so with the imposition of the Section 232 tariffs, it, it came as quite a, a shock and, and frankly, a disappointment. Um, so from January 1st, we have uh, rolled over our kind of counterbalancing measures um, against the, the Section 232. Um, tariffs, and so we'll we'll have to see um, how long that lasts. I mean, it, once the U.S. removes their tariffs, if and when that happens, that is something um, that we will then take actions to remove to remove our counterbalancing measures. Um, but but certainly we would have to agree with Tomas that this is not how we address um, the the real issue of of Chinese overcapacity, and and certainly. Um, had disagreements on the national security nature of of the decision under the um, back in 2018. Yeah, Ren, can you maybe um, for the audience explain a little bit about your counterbalancing measures? No. Yeah, I mean, I I I don't have all of the all of the nitty gritty details, and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards for people who have specific questions. But but it's it's. It's the retaliatory list under Section 232, um, meant to kind of counterbalance some of the um, some of the actions that or the action that was taken. So it, it's targeted to um, to other industries in the United States, um, and and you know meant to bring people to the table um, in the same way that we would look at uh, at, at Airbus Boeing. So. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. It certainly does seem that there's been a, a tit for tat in the last several years. Um, so uh, free trade agreements. Um, I, it doesn't look like the Biden administration will initiate um, new many new free trade agreements, certainly not in the short term. Uh, any new free trade agreements certainly will have enhanced labor and environmental standards. Um, Ryan, but there is one, I'm going to look to the UK here. Um, the US and the UK have been uh, negotiating a free trade agreement and it's fairly far along in the process. Um, can you tell us something about the timeline, how that's going? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. that that's a bright spot in a lot of these conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so for the the United Kingdom, we've had five rounds of negotiations with uh, the United States under the Trump administration, and have made a lot of progress in several chapters. Um, and in particular, looking at how we treat uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, digital trade, and and some other. Uh, 
areas related to services. And so excited about where we got to with the Trump administration and think it's a, a solid foundation to start negotiating under the under the Biden administration. And, and frankly, we're ready to go. Whenever, um, whenever uh, Catherine Ty becomes Ambassador Ty, we are ready to, to kick off uh, round six of those negotiations um, and, and kind of a part of those negotiations, but a bit separate is, you know, we're looking forward to when we can start up um, our small and medium enterprise working group um, that, that unfortunately had to be postponed because of COVID. Um, and so once, once we're able to, you know, move forward um, with, with, uh, future ambassador tie um, and then get get back to some normalcy with related to the pandemic. We're looking forward to to some really good conversations um, that that will come as fruit of that of that free trade agreement. Um, we also think that our our final uh, agreement with the EU has actually put us in a good place. As you're probably aware, the uh, several members of the US Congress were very adamant that if we couldn't get to a solution with the EU, particularly regarding Northern Ireland, a free trade agreement with the United States was just off the table. Um, Chairman Neal made that very clear, and so did Speaker Pelosi. So so we think we're in a good place, and, and we are excited and, and frankly kind of raring to go. That's that's good to hear. I agree with you. That is the bright light. Um, Uber and Tomas, do you can you speak to any um, potential U.S. EU agreement? Um, Uber, I know you're not a diplomat, um, but something in your industry that you want to speak to potentially between the U.S. and the EU. Well, maybe maybe uh, it's a good moment to explain that obviously uh, it's not that simple. <laughs> I guess, and that uh, there are always side effects, uh, like you know, obviously the the parts of the plane, uh, are, you know, with taxation is affecting the U.S. airlines, which have a maintenance uh, organization in the U.S. A little bit like this, uh, one has to realize that the biggest, the largest country for wine consumption in the world is the U.S. So along the way, obviously comes need of wine and and in particular bulk wine and the laws have allowed in the u.s to blend imported wines in bulk uh to maintain cost and quality you know wine is the uh, product of nature so you cannot assume that the quantity will always be there and the quality will always be the same so by blending several origins uh, and that's a you know something which is used quite uh, often every day in California and in New York. New York is a second state in terms of production uh, for wine in in the U.S. Uh, they need imported wines for the you know quality and the and the quantity. And these tariffs are disrupting obviously the sourcing of of their needs. Uh, it's also affecting the price to the consumer. So there is a direct effect also of, uh, you know, penalty, uh, penalty on, on, on to, on to the consumer. Uh, it's also important to, you know, each time that an unnatural action is taken in the market, there is another uh, side effect or a reaction to it. Uh, when in November, 2019, the tariff were imposed on wine, Lots of European uh, nations decided to ship their wine in bulk to avoid precisely the taxation. But in January of this year, this loophole has been removed. So it's affecting now the wineries, which were allowed basically to bottle in the US European wines. So it has a direct effect on the business of American wineries and and their business, and in general, you know, it's it's an industry. Again, first first country in the world in terms of consumption of wine is the U.S., which has a lot of lot of employees, a lot of jobs, a lot of retailers are involved with this. And imported wines account for forty percent of the business. Yes, the majority is made of U.S. wine, but forty percent is imported wine. So, you know. It's needed to complete 
the choice and uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the panel of, of, of quality of products available. It's a good source of education for all of us. And this diversity, not only in wine, is always good. Well, I would love to see more wine and have more wine in, in the United States, of course. But I think it's 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 important to first of all recognize how the European Union and the United States are each other's closest uh, trading partners, um, we have a strong relationship, a large relationship, a significant one. And we have the, the taken the view that we don't necessarily need a big trade agreement to address the the issues, the few issues that we still have in our relationship. First of all, the relationship is strong, and that means we it's going well because of the connections that we have between our people, our cultures. And of course, the shared values and the shared interests we have in the world. Um, but what we believe is necessary is to focus on issues that we fundamentally think can add value to the relationship and to, and to the world, perhaps. And for that, we don't need a, a big trade agreement uh, that takes years and to, to negotiate, uh, typically. Uh, but we can focus on, on more specific issues, such as having a discussion on trade and technology more generally, and how the EU and the United States can set together some of the standards for, uh, let's say, human-centered artificial intelligence, um, some of the questions on, on digital regulation more uh, more generally. Um, that, that is a conversation that we're looking to have, for example, through the creation of a trade and technology council that we have uh, put forward. And in the meantime, we will, of course, always be uh, interested to address specific issues that our companies raise. And there's a, there's, there's a few in, in the wine uh, industry as well. Uh, we have an EU-US wine uh, and spirits agreement that addresses most of the issues. And, and because of that, we have uh, those close connections and those uh, those, those shipments that are taking place, but I appreciate, in, like in any relationship, there's always a little bit of work to be done. And so we're looking forward to doing that, but we're not doing that through a big uh, trade agreement, we're rather doing that through specific initiatives uh, that we hope to advance now with the Biden-Harris administration. Right, thank you. Um, and uh, I mean, it's much too early to have a timeline on that, I, I would imagine. We, we are ready. We are, um, like you, we are going to watch uh, the, the, the Senate uh, confirmation hearing of Catherine Tai tomorrow. And we're hoping as early, when, whenever she's confirmed, as early as next week, um, that our leadership will speak to uh, then hopefully Ambassador Tai and have that conversation. Uh, we have put out a full agenda back in December, EU US uh, agenda for global change, where we outline many of those uh, ideas and the ideas that we start discussing. So we've been very specific already in suspending tariffs for six months and taking the time in the OECD also to come to a solution on digital taxation and we we're hoping that we can create this trade and technology council um, as soon as possible as well so we have a full a full agenda there we're ready to go yeah that's wonderful well it sounds like we'll need we'll need a follow-up conversation we should check in in six months and and review the issues and see how much progress we've made but um yeah I'm I'm sensing some optimism uh, from both the UK and the EU, so that that's wonderful to hear. Um, okay, just onto a topic which is not so optimistic: um, forced labor. Uh, it's been a prohibition to import goods and services made with forced labor into the United States for for quite a while. Um, the statute, it's Section 1307 of the U.S. Code. Um, all goods made with forced labor and their parts, wholly or in part. Um, are not admitted. It's from the Tariff Act of 1930. So as I said, it, it's been a violation for quite a while. Um, and now there's a focal point on imports made in China's Xinjiang region. And there's been lots of involvement from Congress, the Department of Labor and Customs. Uh, on February 18th, the bipartisan group uh, reintroduced the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in the House, which creates a rebuttable presumption that goods made in Xinjiang are made with forced labor and they're prohibited from entering the U.S. unless there's clear and convincing evidence shown to the contrary. A bill with the same name was also introduced in the Senate, also um, with uh, bipartisan support. Uh, one comment regarding the House bill, it does require public companies to disclose if they've been engaged with Chinese companies in the Uyghur region. So that, that's something to watch for public companies. Um, now, Customs has also recently issued a region-wide withhold release order, which authorizes the agency to detain cotton and tomato products from Xinjiang, and that includes goods that are shipped to other countries that contain cotton or tomatoes. 
that are originating from that region. Now, this is this is huge. I mean, just in terms of the cotton, uh, Xinjiang supplies one fifth of the world's cotton. Biden, it's highly unlikely that he would reverse this withhold release order. Now, goods that are subject to a withhold release order, a WRO, can, are detained by customs. And importers then have the option of either exporting the goods or providing proof of admissibility. And they have three months in which to do so. And then customs can deny entry after that time if they decide that the proof is insufficient. Um, and there's, it's also very clear that there's a potential for additional withhold release orders on other products, such as apparel, food, electronics. Um, but clearly, Biden is uh, supporting increased enforcement of forced labor provisions. Uh, customs has increased enforcement. And there's the pending congressional legislation. So importers into the US really need to focus on this issue, protect their brands, the integrity of their supply chains, um, strengthen internal controls, increase visibility into their supply chains, and, and plan for the contingency that their products may not be allowed entry into the US. Um, so Tomas, um, the EU, as, as we mentioned, recently signed the investment agreement with China. Um, and uh, the EU did get some criticism at the time because of China's human rights record with the Uyghurs. Um, can you speak to what the EU is doing to combat forced labor? And then we'll turn to Ryan if you could uh, respond for the UK as well. Well, thank you, Laura. That's a very important uh, issue indeed, and we see a lot of discussion about it. And I should maybe start by stressing how much we share uh, the same values with the United States, and not only share interests, but also values such as climate change uh, and climate protection, of course, environmental protection, and, and forced labor is absolutely out there as, as the big, uh, one of the big concerns that we have and that we share with the United States. So we're very happy and looking forward to working together more on, on this issue as on others um, in making sure that we, that, we, that we raise the level of protection and that we exclude human rights violations in China or wherever they may um, occur. Now, you're right, we have concluded at the political level comprehensive agreement on investment. And that is an investment agreement that is comprehensive precisely because we have sought to labor commitments where we want China to fully implement uh, the key core conventions of the international labor organizations, the ILO conventions. Uh, that is a critical commitment for us. And that is part of China interpreting in its domestic order necessary steps to basically make sure that there is no forced labor, that we have decent work and uh, labor provisions um, in China. So we're very committed uh, to that. Uh, but you're right, there have been some questions and even some criticism on that. And I think that has to do a lot with the fact that uh, this is such a big issue and there's such great expectations for, uh, for, for dealing with this issue in, in the context of any agreement. So it's, it's quite normal that people think that agreement will solve all issues and it will not necessarily solve everything overnight. It's clear that this will take time. And it's clear that we need a toolbox that consists of many different tools. And our comprehensive agreement on investment is one tool in that toolbox. It's part of the conversation and the cooperation that we want to have with uh, China. But in the same way, as we were already mentioning, we need to also make sure that our companies manage and are, are aware of the integrity of their supply chain, which is why the European Union will come forward later this year with a proposal on what we call now sustainable corporate governance uh, principles that will precisely also uh, introduce a, a certain level of obligations on companies to make sure that they do not import uh, uh, or products that, that come from um, forced labor or other um, uh, places around uh, around. The world. So we're very committed to uh, eradicating forced labor practices, avoiding uh, human rights violations around the world, in particular in relation to China and to Xinjiang. Um, and we're obviously committed to working uh, with the United States. Don't think that the comprehensive agreement on investment is going to solve it all overnight. It's just one part of a bigger puzzle. And it's clear that we have more work there and we, we're looking forward to that together with the United States. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm going to echo some of what Thomas has said is that the UK and the US share many of the same values and certainly trying to address forced labor is, is one of those. Um, it's quite an active debate um, in the UK right now, how to specifically proceed with with China um, and in reference to um, the Uyghur population in, in Western China. So there's, um, it's still active. And so there's no conclusive um, statement that I can really make on, on that effort, but, but it, 
there we want to find some kind of solution um, to this and and there have been other areas that um, particularly with supply chains and rare earth minerals um, and and other uh, commodities like uh, diamonds is, an, is another one as well where um, countries and companies have worked together to kind of come up with with measures to look into their supply chains and, and create some um, transparency. Um, and so we'll be looking at a whole slew of, of options kind of moving forward, but but it's a it's a very active debate right now um, in in the United Kingdom. Yeah, thank you. Um, you're right. And I and I think also you know, sort of circling back to our technology discussion. Um, technology is going to play a, a big role, I think, in in the responsibility that companies take upon themselves to, you know, to make sure that they don't have forced labor in their supply chains. They're, they're um, because, you know, if you're an apparel retailer in the United States, you know, you're not there when the cotton is picked. Um, but there are technological, you know, um, solutions now that are being developed that I think will be very helpful in this regard, um, you know, to, to eradicate that problem. Um, okay, we have some questions, but I just want to give the panel some time to uh, make final thoughts. Um, we'd like to start with Hubert. Um, a number of questions have come in, so if you could um, combine your final comments um, and speak specifically, Hubert, on uh, the impact of Again, you know, the Airbus Boeing dispute, its impact on wine, on that industry, um, and and sort of and and what's happened globally because of it. Um, you know, New Zealand wines, for example, um, their market share is up. So if you could, thank you. And then we'll, we'll then we'll go to uh, Tomas and Ryan. Um, yeah, the, one of the questions, thank you, Laura, was was related that I could read was related to, uh, you know, what is the WTO uh, going to say about the fact that some wine or some countries of origin have not been taxed uh, and others are? Um, well, a, a maybe not official but logical answer to the fact that New Zealand wines and Australian wines are not taxed most probably come from the fact that. 80% of the brands dominating these two segments are owned by U.S. companies. So that could be an answer to that. In any way, the WTO does not have the right to correct or in make any, any uh, decision on which category U.S. is penalizing through this retaliation tariff process. WTO has authorized U.S. to penalize $7.5 million or billion dollars or whatever the number is. Don't quote me on that. I'm not the specialist. Um, but at least a certain amount of money. And they have the right to pick and choose which product, which country of origin they deem appropriate. And WTO, to my knowledge, doesn't have the right to interfere into that decision process. Another question is related to when is this going to go away? Well, I'm praying. I'm praying like all of us. <laughs> um, one of the side effects, maybe as a conclusion on my side, is to say that we didn't want that, but it has forced us to premiumize our wines. And they became more and more attractive to the chains because they are more expensive. And, and, and therefore, you see in the last six months, business of French wines in particular up by 28%, according to Nielsen, just because the price went up. And I know it's kind of uh, bizarre, but the premiumization is interesting for the chain because they don't want to push the products which are at the bottom of the price. They want something at a higher level, making more money. So it's a side effect, I guess, to a retaliation tariff to help that very same country of origin products. Positive effect. Thank you. Thomas? Well, I, I heard you say, Laura, that you were uh, optimistic after this, this conversation. I, I would maybe uh, quote uh, Charles de Gaulle to quote a Frenchman who said that he was neither an optimist nor a pessimist. He was determined. And we are determined to 
have our next conversation about wines without speaking about parents. Um, and uh, we're very committed to, uh, to dealing with these issues as mentioned. We're hoping we, we have a partner in the White House now uh, to remove these tensions and these threats and then really come to the more positive agenda that we need to deal with. And there's, there's plenty of global challenges out there for which we need to work together. And that, that, is, that is what we're uh, looking to do. I think what is very important is what Hubert said. We are talking about a product, and, and that's the case for many European products that, that, have, that, that have to do with quality uh, and that are very complementary to the US market in general. Um, if you look at agriculture as a sector, we are exporting a lot of high value uh, products, including wines and spirits. And we are, we are, we're loving soybeans from the United States, for example, which we don't produce and which is the prime source of our animal feed um, in, in Europe. Um, so we have very complementary markets. We love bourbon as well, um, and it's perfectly possible to, to do both and to enjoy both. And that is how we are closely integrated. And we need to recognize that reality of, of that close integration, those shared interests and shared values, as I mentioned. Uh, and, and I use that really as a basis to, uh, to work together, to find uh, solutions. Um, the tariffs are, are never a solution. I've already mentioned it, so we're very much uh, committed to, to removing them and to finding a solution to deal with what we believe are to be the, the real issues out there. Thank you. And, and I guess I'll close by just saying that, that the UK is their largest trading partners are the European Union and, and the United States. The United States is our largest single country um, trading partner. And it, it's important for us um, since the historic decision to, to leave the European Union to, to really um, take advantage and, and take seriously this opportunity to be a global player um, and certainly wanting to set a, a positive uh, path forward with both um, the United States and the European Union and, and moving forward and, and um, you know, using our voice at the WTO, at the UN, um, in, in the OECD and G7 to, to, to help move us forward out of both the COVID pandemic get into these um, bigger questions around China and and what do we do with um, technology that has changed greatly. And, and we are um, excited about stretching our legs in, in that regard um, and looking forward to, to working with, with our partners and our allies. Um, I think that that's crucial um, where there's, where there's uh, shared interest and a will, there is a way and, and we'll, we'll make that happen. Thanks. Good, thank you. Um, and before I turn it over to Christina, I'll just say my, my final comment is that um, I, we, we don't expect the Biden administration um, to use tariffs as a negotiating tool like you know, like they were used uh, with Section 301 with products from China and Airbus and potentially DFT. I, it, it's, that's, I think there's gonna be a really a look at the substantive issues and have a global strategy and a holistic approach to the issues, I would say, but not just uh, tariffs as a negotiating tool. So I am optimistic. Um, okay, Christina, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, all of you. I think this was an absolutely fascinating conversation and a very nice update to the event that we had a few months ago, so maybe we will be turning this into a series. I wanted to thank our wonderful speakers, Thomas, Ryan, Hubert, and our wonderful moderator, Laura, for a very interesting and complete update on the trade relations, the US-EU trade relations, and, you know, what is it, what happens next? And I, I agree with, with Tom, determination here on both sides uh, should be the key word. So again, thank you very much. Um, I would like to tell all of our audience, thank you very much also for participating, for your questions. I think we've answered them, all of them live, uh, which you know we're very happy that we're able to do. If you have any additional questions, you can send them on to me and I will pass them on to the speakers. EACC is a connector. So just like in live events, we'll be providing attendees with a list of participants. And then if you want to connect to anybody, you can do so via your local chapters. Also, this program was recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel very soon. Keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on our website and we hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much to everyone. Bye.